that uh, I know that you're you're all probably buying this on Amazon right now. <laughs> but please don't, because in fact you can you can um, get it. I believe at uh, you can get it at a fine price. Um, you get an extra special frame worthy drawing right uh, with it. Take by it right here um, in the lobby and. Um, and also, Amazon is somewhat evil, and we don't, <laughs> uh, we don't want to support that. So, it is my great pleasure to welcome here Elaine Shalino and special guest star Edmund White. Um, Elaine Shalino has written, writes, and has written for some time for the New York Times. She is the former New York Times Paris bureau chief. She's been based in Paris since 2002. She's a specialist of French history with, uh, I believe, a degree in French history from the university that I'm not going to mention. Um, it's not this one, but um, it's a it's, um, you know, it's a perfectly respectable university. Um, Elaine Shalino is the author of of five books, um, and uh, in chronological order, The Outlaw State, Saddam Hussein's Quest for Power in the Gulf Crisis, um, first published in 1991, and then a number of these have been reissued in 2000, in 2000, and then reissued in 2005, Persian Mirrors, The Elusive Face of Iran, and then after um, she uh, became the Paris bureau chief, La Séduction, How the French Play the Game of Life, first published in 2011. And The Only Street in Paris, Life on the Rue des Martyrs, published in 2015, and now, and, oh, and also another book entitled La Dernière Rue de Paris, Enquête sur la Rue des Martyrs, published in 2016, and a translation of the Rue des Martyrs book. And I um, am, uh, I feel particularly well placed to say that it is not easy to get the French to translate American books about France. It's just not. So for that alone, I think Elaine deserves uh, our admiration and kudos, whatever those are. Um, OK, and now, of course, The Seine, The River That Made Paris, which has just been published by Norton and which we're here to talk about. And I will say that Edmund Light needs no introduction and um, He's not really going to get one <laughs> because he, just out of sheer generosity, um, agreed to join us up here, um, kind of at the last minute. And he is literally the author of too many books, and not only too many books for me to name, but I suspect too many books for him to name. Uh, I remember that uh, the first time. Um, I uh, interviewed you years ago. I asked you how many books you had published, and you said airily, oh, I don't know, around 15 or something like that. But that was in 2000. <laughs> um, so many, many books, including, I happen to have here a, uh, a preliminary look at a novel, his latest novel, I titled The Saint from Texas with a really great cover, and I have not yet had a chance to read it, but I've heard a little bit about it, and I know that it's going to be great, and it's going to be published in August. 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 Okay, so, um, so. It's about transistor oil rich from Dallas in the 50s, and one becomes a French baroness, and the other one becomes a saint. <laughs> So uh, you can um, start pre-ordering at your local independent bookstore now. Um, okay, and so without further ado, um, I will pass the floor to uh, Elaine Shalino, who has, I believe, some images that, um, for us, and then we'll talk about the book. Um, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, first, I want to thank Shani here for inviting me back to Columbia. I would have come to Columbia instead of NYU, but I didn't get in. 
So uh, but there's always possibilities. I keep threatening no to come to Elizabeth's classes, and she keeps kind of pushing me away. But you know, something I would really like to read first, uh, and uh, and maybe she will uh, she will teach me why I um, should not stop at about the uh, third volume. Of, uh, <laughs> Well, no, the fourth volume is the best. So thank you, Shani. Thank you, my daughter, Gabriella, who uh, just got off the plane from Paris and uh, who uh, is my uh, one of my partners uh, in helping with this book and has taken some of the wonderful photographs. And she also works full time at Columbia, although not for the Maison Française, uh, but uh, she did, she's joining us. Elizabeth. I cannot, Elizabeth and I had an accidental um, uh, friendship. Uh, it actually was because of Edmund White, although he doesn't have any remembrance, uh, any memory of this, this occasion. We were together in Paris, but uh, Paula Claire, who's with us in spirit uh, tonight, who uh, is, uh, and I thank him for this evening, uh, or organized at Columbia's uh, campus in Paris um, a weekend, a literary weekend, and there was um, Edmund White and Elizabeth Leighton speaking to each other in French about great thoughts. And I had just reread Edmund White's book, The Flaneur, uh, which uh, has to be the best book of our generation written about uh, Paris in English. And I am one of those kind of like groupies that went up to, the, to, to him, totally ignored Elizabeth, and said, hi, Edmund. You know, that's, that's you know what you do. It's not true, it's not true. We, but you and I became friends, Edmund forgot me. Um, so <laughs> I, I, you don't know me, but I just reread The Flaneur, and it is indeed the best book that has been written about um, about Paris by any American since uh, American born uh, uh, lover of France, since Hemingway and, um, and uh, Julian Green. And he said, Why don't you come to dinner with us tonight? So I went along to dinner and bonded with Elizabeth, and thank the Lord that Ed White did not remember that he had met me because he would not have been able to review my book for the New York Times if he knew me. Uh, and so, uh, so we are reconnecting now, and maybe we'll, we're going to have dinner again tonight, and maybe we'll remember. <laughs> so he's not going to review your next book. He's not going to review my book. That's right. And and I have to I have to thank Elizabeth. Um, who has become a great friend because she saved me from myself for two books. I mean, she she um, informed me. She read every single word of this book and corrected it from beginning to end. And uh, she informed me, for example, that Pliny the Elder was a Roman writer, not a Greek painter, <laughs> and that George Sand and Flaubert were not lovers. And they could have been lovers even though George Sand was 17 years older than Flaubert, but they were not, and I should take that out of my book. So thanks to Elizabeth, um, I was saved from many, many errors, and I will forever be great. <laughs> no, I, 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 I didn't go through every single one, but you did mark up the entire manuscript from beginning to end, telling you where I, I got it from. Um, Edmund White, well, you know, he just got the the Lifetime Achievement Award from from the National Book Award, uh, and uh, that's kind of like winning the Oscar for um, for literature. Um, it, this is what was said about him: a master of narrative and craft across fiction, journalism, memoir, and more. Now, I'm one of those people, I don't know, authors sometimes can become obsessed with Amazon, so every few days you look up your name on Google and things pop up. And one morning, what popped up but a review of my book in the New York Times by Edmund White. I thought it was fake news. <laughs> I mean, I could not believe that this was the, the real thing. I, I have to tell you, Edmund, I, 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 I cried. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> because I couldn't believe it. And then here was Edmund White saying, she sounds as if she'd be the perfect American fellow traveler in France. And I just want to tell you, you come back to France and we will go explore the Seine together. Is that okay? All right, terrific. So, and I said to my husband, I called him up and I said, if nothing else good happens with this book, this is, this is it. And tonight, you know, being on the stage with these two wonderful um, 
scholars and, and humanists and intellectuals, as the French would say. Uh, I just have to quote my Sicilian grandfather who used to tell the story about, um, I called it the shepherd story. It was the story about um, uh, the, the shepherds coming to see Jesus, you know, in the, the manger, and, you know, they realized that it's only going to happen once. There's a, there's a saying, pick it up, it's, it's sort of Sicilian, but the dialect. But it basically means the shepherd saw Jesus only once. And this is my shepherd moment for now, because it doesn't get any better than this. And then one of my dearest, oldest friends, Pat Pellegrini, brings me an, an antique teapot of Notre Dame. Oh. Well, it's going to be antique tonight. <laughs> <laughs> priceless. Let's make it priceless. Okay, so let's... Now that I've said and gotten everybody moved to tears, let's talk about a river, and not just any river, but the most romantic river in the world. And because we all like to be entertained and we like visuals, I'm going to show some visuals before the, before we start talking. Mm -hmm. If there are things that you want to say, correct me. Uh, or, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the way I'm coming off. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're in the Okay, and which way does this go? Okay, all right. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes? Okay. All right, this is the Sand River. It, it's it's, uh, it's 777 kilometers long. If it were a straight line, it would be half that length. It starts in this very banal part of uh, France, the uh, in Burgundy, not the fancy part of the, the, uh, the wine, but uh, the very banal part that's uh, just a lot of agricultural land and, and a lot of cows, sort of northeast of the It goes to Paris and then all the way to Honfleur and La Havre, the estuary. This is the, these are the sources of the set, and it says sources because it's not one source, but many sources, it's sort of bubbling up from the ground. And look in the middle, what does it say? It's sort of weird about that. The field of hockey, why does it say no? Because Napoleon III in 1864 decides that he wants to extend the, uh, the power of Paris and absorb all the sand and he sells and Batman Osman is either the savior or the destroyer of Frank Paris as we know it to this banal place about 175 miles away from Paris and declares it Paris. So this is basically the 21st among the month of Paris. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you saw the article I wrote about the bridges of Paris. This is really the first bridge of Paris in the source of the sand. Here we've got the temple, a Gallo-Roman healing temple at the source of the Seine. It was like a village. You can take from as far as the Mediterranean and what is now the English Channel to throw offerings or ex votos uh, into that pool, like sort of effigies of body parts. So if you had a problem with your leg, you threw a leg, a wooden leg, and if you had problems with eyes, you threw, you threw an effigies, effigy of eyes. Because you were praying to the goddess Sequana, the, the healing goddess of the sun, uh, sort of like you know, Elizabeth Lady said, who was my goddess. Um, well, it's not getting carried away. It's my, it's my show too. I can spy you about it if I want to. And Gabrielle, my daughter Gabrielle, took this photograph at the museum. We sweet talked them into taking the statue out of its case so that we could photograph it. And uh, I thought that she was so um, she was so spectacular that she should build a big a big statue the same size as the Statue of Liberty that's sitting in the middle of the um, the Seine, you know, on that island. Uh, it's a quarter size statue. How big is this? This is only like about two feet. But just imagine if she were a, a big. You know, and she's the goddess of the sun, and there's no statue of her. She's riding on a duck. And she's riding on a duck book. Yeah, exactly. Can I ask what it's made of? It's, it's, it's bronze, and it's bronze, and it's, it's very beautifully preserved. And um, she's uh, she would be the best female icon because she's not religious like Joan of Arc or a Lady of Lourdes. She's not Republican like Marianne, but leading us to this. What's her, what's her hand gesture? Uh, we think that she could have been holding something in her hand, like a plate of um, like a plate of 
fruit, uh, but we, we don't we don't know. The museum loves her so much that they call her um, the, the museum's Mona Lisa. And there's also a feminist thing up here. This is for Elizabeth's benefit because are there any other feminists in this room? Feminists <laughs> <laughs> left in America because. In the 18th no, century. Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Because, because Jacques Archibert de Saint Pierre, remember him calling this Virginia? He turned her into this legend. He took, he made her the handmaiden of Demeter. Oh yes. I'm sorry. I'm I'm having trouble hearing. Would you mind using yes. the mic? Oh, sure. Of course. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. Right. I beg your pardon. My fault. Oh, thank you for interrupting me. Is this better? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, Tamir was looking for her daughter, Persephone, you know, in, in, in Hades, because hey, she had eaten the poisoned fruit of the, and she was dead. She was, she was kidnapped by Pluto, actually. Yes, she was kidnapped by Pluto. Still correct. But she was, but of course she is, but that's her job. Yeah, but, but, well, why don't you tell us, just tell us briefly about the story of Persephone. Well, I'm sure that everybody knows the story of Persephone. Wait, who knows the story of Persephone? See, not everybody knows the story of Persephone, but would you like me? Okay, okay. Um, so uh, Demeter, who is in Latin series, the goddess of breakfast cereal, and that's why we have the goddess of the harvest, Demeter's daughter, um, Persephone or Proserpina in Latin um, is uh, Hades or Pluto, the god of the underworld, wants her. So he, who is also her uncle, but you know, whatever. Um, uh, he kidnaps her and they work out a deal. When there's a, the pomegranate seeds are involved in a way that I don't remember uh, offhand, but they work out a deal so that she's um, in Hades for, for half the year and on Earth for uh, half the year, and that is why we have seasons. Well, in the Gallo-Roman version, Sequana was D Demeter's handmaid. And when Demeter gives up, you know, getting Persephone out forever, um, she fires Sequana. And Sequana, as a good feminist, says, well, I want to be paid. So um, Demeter, or, or Ceres, Ceres, gives her some lands and then promises her protection. So this is what happens uh, when, when Sequana herself is almost attacked by Neptune, who falls, comes rushing out of the sea, falls madly in love with her, and tries to grab her and take her away. When Neptune reached out his arms to seize her, her body melted into water. Her veil and green garments, which the winds blew before her, became emerald-colored waves. She was transformed into a river of that color, which still delights in wandering the places she loved as a nymph. Sequana becomes the Sen River, and the word Sen is, a, is morphed from the word Sequana. In fact, some people still call the river Sequana. And where does that text come from? That comes from... Uh, 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 Bernadette de Saint Pierre. Yeah. Okay. Let's say, but there she is, and I took this picture. Does she have a nice face? Don't you like the nice, the nice statue in the middle of? Uh, I even, I even applied for. There was a contest, uh, and I applied. I put in a formal application with the to reinvent the Sen, and I got rejected, but because I didn't have a financial plan. But anybody who wants to get into my financial plan to build the statue. Uh, see me later. She's not. You're laughing, but you know what? I was in the Berkshires, and I said to everybody, "I want to build the statue." And this woman came up to me later and said, "I don't have much money." And I thought, because we were signing books, she was didn't have enough money to buy the book. So I said, "Well, you can get it in your library." And she said, "No, no, no. The Sequana Project. I don't have much money, but if you build it, I'm in." <laughs> this is the Sen as it's growing and becoming the mighty Sen. <laughs> she, did, did she, buy the <laughs> she did. She did. Yeah, this is the sun as it gets bigger. This is the sun. This is champagne. You want champagne on the sun? Everybody knows champagne, the fancy champagne domain. This is a domain that's right on the sun. It's a different champagne. They'll invite you in. You don't have to wear fancy clothes and, and ascot and uh, Italian shoes. You just walk in and they'll take a bottle out of their old refrigerator. 
This is the coat of arms, and we're going to have a little contest. Who knows what the motto there means? I do. <laughs> who, who says yes? Yes? Floats, but it doesn't sink. You get the first award of the night. Here you go, a frame ready picture. Yes. This motto is on, and you see it's a boat on the set. This motto, you see it on, on uh, the sides of buildings, on the sides of bridges, on the sides of park benches. Um, you'll see it in Paris design. Uh, and uh, I don't know, how many of you read my book on the Rue de Martyr? Okay, do you remember the, um, the bit about nightlife where the first striptease, modern striptease, is created on the Rue de Martyr? I'm going to do a little version of just a very sedate, because we're calling me a striptease. And show you my vintage Hermes scarf that has the seal of the city of Paris. And, and Edmund fell in love with it, so he's going to. He gets to wear it for the rest, or gets to to to, to, to wave it for the rest of the year. Well, you should. You're absolutely right because you don't even know what the next slide is, which is. Edmund mentioned he's, he he told me I should mention the Bataclan survivors. <clears throat> On November 13, 2015, that was the night of the ter terrible terrorist attacks. On that Friday night in Paris that killed 130 people. It was the Bataclan Concert Hall, the Stade de France, some of the bistros and bars, and Flo to Adnick Marity Tour, tossed by the waves that does not sink, became the motto of Paris. Uh, uh, and, and you can see the seal of the city of Paris on both sides. But these are some of the things you can do on the Seine. You can dance salsa on the Seine. You can fish on the Seine. You can dive off a diving board built by Anne Hidalgo, the mayor, uh, into the Seine River. This is sex on the Seine. You know, um, one of my uh, friends said, you can't write a book about the Seine and not have a chapter on sex. Would you, would you bear with me if I read a, a brief passage about sex? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, well, because some people think that the Seine is just about romance, but it's also about sex. And this was, it was a, a Chinese fireworks uh, artist who, during one year of Nuit Blanche, when, when Paris stays open all night and there are all of these uh, different art installations, did something that was called One Night Stand. I mean, what is the ultimate sex fantasy except to have a one night stand on the Seine? So I just uh, read this very quickly. One night stand opened at midnight with the sounds of sex, heavy breathing, gasping, and moaning, woven into a contemporary musical composition and broadcast across the river by loudspeaker. Rhythmic drumming and what sounded like a monkey's mating call added auditory texture. Next, you can laugh, you don't think it's funny? <laughs> a pyrotechnic display set fireworks into the air the act lasted 12 minutes, estimated to be the length of time the average French couple needs to climax. <laughs> then the artist transformed a bottle of into a love boat where 50 couples from around the world had sex inside translucent <laughs> red tents. The couples were given the option of either turning off the lights in their tents to copulate privately, or turning them on to reveal their silhouettes in motion, to share the bliss with the crowd the lovers could press the buttons, signaling operators in small boats nearby to send a 15 second spurt of bright white fireworks into the air. There it is. And here's the Statue of Liberty where we could either knock her down and put up Sequana or maybe give her a partner, you know, and the Sequana. And here's Notre Dame before the spire fell. And here is the little boat that could, the boat that, that saved Notre Dame, because it turns out that half of the water that was used to put out the fire at Notre Dame came from the waters of the Seine. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was great. Um, 
Well, basically, so I, I'm a little bit tempted to read Edmund White's review because, uh, so would you mind if you, no. would you want to read it? No, I'm fine. Okay. All right. I, I think that, um, I mean, when I was thinking uh, of what I wanted to say, I realized that in fact Edmund had said it much more eloquently than I could have. So if you don't mind, you, um, I thought we could, I could maybe start us off by, by reading Edmund's review. I learned so much from this book. Elaine Shalino is a graceful, companionable writer, someone who speaks about France in the most enjoyably American way. The French pride themselves on conversing on a lofty plane. When Americans start exchanging anecdotes or matching experiences, many French people raise an eyebrow and ask, hey, what's your point? <laughs> they want to know the principle that can be drawn from all this real life trivia. Typically, the French, for whom philosophy is a high school requirement, can break you, which is a mess, not a word that I've ever but it's um, with the monkey is climbing from one branch. Can radiate from, um, I mean, that's, anyway, okay. Um, can radiate from abstraction to abstraction and might become disgruntled when we Americans say, give me an example. Shalino, on the contrary, proceeds from colorful detail to revealing detail, gently informing even as she entertains. Dolce et utile. Full disclosure, and then he says that he had, um, in fact, uh, never had, had, did not remember ever having um, met Elaine Shalino, but he can no longer claim that, so that's obviously no longer true. So, although I've written books, not me, but he, uh, although I've written books about Paris or set there, I never researched the Seine and so never knew some of the many things Shalino tells us. That, that I, and it was now, it was when I read this that I realized that, um, that I should just read this because my attempt to find, I mean, there is one thing that you didn't mention that I just love about this, which was that Henri IV, Henry IV went skinny dipping in the sand, which is something that in all of my, um, in all of my classes was never mentioned. <laughs> the most interesting thing that I learned about Henri IV. So um, anyway, here, here's, here is Edmund's list. That the team who lit Paris bridges, monuments, and boulevards with surgical knives of illumination in the 1980s was led by a single genius, François Jousse. That Paris spends more than $15 million a year on public lighting. That scores of people celebrate a fish festival every September on the island best known for Georges Seurat's masterpiece, A Sunday on La Grand Jatte. The inspiration as well uh, for Stephen Sondheim's musical Sunday in the Park with George. That the coat of arms of Paris bears the image of a, as you saw, of a storm-tossed ship in the Latin words fluctuat net murder, she is tossed on the waves but does not sink, which is also the refrain of that Georges Brassens song, um, Les Copains d'Abord, which became a slogan of resistance after 130 people were killed in 2015 during the terrorist attacks on the Plateau the concert hall, and other sites. That the first Paris K was constructed in 1312. That a monument near Rouen commemorates the transfer of Napoleon's ashes to a boat that carried them to their final resting place in Paris at Les Invalides. That when Roman Catholics slaughtered Protestants in 1572 and dumped their bodies into the Seine, the river turned red with blood. Shalino tells us almost incidentally about the places that have claimed to be the source of the sand, about the songs, movies, poems, and paintings devoted to the river, about its bridges and its history in World War II, and about the origins of the names Paris, Seine, and Lutetia. The Parisii were the first permanent inhabitants of what is now the Ile de la Cité, in the middle of the Seine. The Seine is named after a pre-Christian, as you all know, the Seine is named after a pre-Christian healing goddess, Sequana. And Lutetia, the Roman name, Lutetia, Lutetia, um, the Roman name of Paris, is perhaps a vision of a Celtic phrase that means houses midstream. Along the way, we learned that Shalino has a husband of more than 30 years named Andy, <laughs> who, who is present here now. Who's yeah, coming? Yeah, yeah, he's with his, he's with his mother right who, now. Who may, Very devoted to his mother. So who well may, as uh, 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 virtuous, um, a husband of more than 30 years named Andy, and among other personal tidbits that she once wrote about pork belly futures as a reporter in Chicago. But Shalino is a true journalist, more interested in her subject than in herself. 
She isn't snobbish and is as likely to cite Doris Day as Francis Poulain. To learn from an old sailor as from a historian to discuss the edge warfare fought against the Germans in Normandy as to relay Napoleon's opinion of the steam engine, a child's toy. I suppose everyone, French or foreigner, is predisposed to love Paris. Yet most Parisians scornfully reduce their lives to métro, boulot, dodo, subway, job, sleep. Many tourists, especially the Japanese, apparently suffer a form of cultural shock, culture shock called Paris syndrome, extreme disillusionment that can result in dizziness, hallucinations, a persecution complex, even vomiting. People expect Paris to be romantic, dreamy, maybe friendly. The thousands of lovers' padlocks that were fastened to its bridges as a pledge of fidelity before the government ordered them sawed off attest to these expectations. Whereas New Yorkers repeatedly will walk out of their way to help visitors find their destination. Really? <laughs> um, a French study years ago revealed that when foreigners asked Parisians for directions, a considerable number deliberately sent them the wrong way. That's considered funny in France. Lest I sound prejudiced, like so many of my American compatriots, for whom it's an idée reçue to say France would be delightful if it weren't for the French, I should clarify that I'm a passionate Francophile. Unlike Americans, the French admire writers, and the French strike me as the brainiest and most rapidly changing and adaptive people on earth. They may be standoffish at first, but once won over their fair and fellow rather friends for life. I can't remember which 19th century English thinker wrote that talking about national character is a childish pursuit, but I'm sure he was right. However, we all do it even though we know better. In any event, most people love Paris and deservedly so. They're all struck by its beauty, marvel in its perfection of luxe and recognize that its museums are among the very best in the world and that its subways really do work. The list is endless. As a well-informed Parisian cultist, Elaine Cholino has laid one more beautiful and amusing wreath on the altar of the city of life. So, that, um, that, uh, um, but so, okay, so I couldn't possibly have said that better, um, and therefore, uh, thank you for um, doing my work for me this evening. And um, so now, basically, the thing that I wanted to um, to ask about was how, first of all, how you had the idea of writing this, and how you went about researching it. That's how, I mean, there's so much, it, it, just an incredible amount of research that went into this, and I'm just wondering if you could talk to us about the about how it happened and, and how you managed to do that. Well, the origin of the book started with a very painful chapter of my life because I fell in love with the Seine when I first moved to Paris as a young foreign correspondent from Newsweek magazine the first time. Uh, and I moved to Paris from Chicago because um, my first husband came home one day and said he didn't want to be married anymore. And um, four months later, and I gave him half of everything, and four months later he was married to someone else, and, and I went off to Paris. But it was really very hard because I came with no lovers, no friends, no sources. But I had the scent. And every day I would walk home from the office in the fancy movie for work center the play in the eighth of my small across the Pont de Lama. No, New York. No, the New York is just the office. Across the Pont de Lama to the right of the uh, uh, near the Eiffel Tower. And I would stand in the middle of the bridge and no one had to know that I was lonely or that my French was horrible. And I would look out at the sunset over the sun and I would just say it's going to be okay and I kept that love that love of the sun deepened over years and when I when I wanted to, to, to have a new project um, a friend said to me what what is meaningful for you about Paris and that's when I said the sun and I had no idea when I started the project just how long and complicated and how much time it would take. How many years did you research? It took, from beginning to end, it took almost three years. But in the meantime, I, in that three years, I was also marrying off a daughter and organizing a, a very big wedding in Washington, D.C. So that took a lot of time. And I was teaching a, a course at Princeton full time. So, um, so to me, that doesn't sound like very much time to do something like this. 
Yeah, but there's skimmers and then there's people like you. You know, there are there are scholars and then there are journalists, and it's a different yeah. approach. Yeah, that's why I want to hear. Yeah. I want to hear it's about it. How did you do it? You you have to. You, you, I'm not Robert Caro. You know, yeah. I did not. Did I had to decide when it was enough for me, mm -hmm. and so that I didn't get to know every barge man along the set. You know, I, I guess you know a lot of barge men. I did get to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe not everyone. Yeah, I mean, I picked, I picked one. I picked one bookies, one bookseller, not all 240 of them. So I really, I, I did it. I, I said to myself, you know, what you have to do in journalism. You know, journalism is about accuracy and doneness. It's not about perfection. And and, and so I, I set limits. Mm -hmm. Plus, I have people like you, uh, friends who, uh, who, you know, I created a village of people who said, okay. This is enough research, like you can write this now. So how did you um, decide what, because, I don't know, writing a book about a river, it seems to me that there were all, the, 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 the number of uh, aspects of it that you could have chosen for your chapters must have been sort of limitless. How did you decide on what you were going to include? Well, you have to decide who's your reader. And my reader was, I thought to myself, this is would be my mother, God rest her soul. You know, this was a re, this was a book for um, the, the uh, people who loved France and loved Paris and wanted to learn more about France. And it was it was a book that I could say, okay, you think you know France? Well, maybe I'm going to tell you a few things that you don't know. And so that's why I wrote a chapter on songs of the Seine, for example, or another chapter on bridges of the Seine. So may I ask, would you say that the the, 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 the target reader of this book. How, what relation does the target reader of this book play to the target reader of the New York Times, for instance? The Times travel section. I think it's the same reader. It's the same reader because, I, you know, I'm a journalist. I, I never, uh, you know, I went to graduate school, as you very kindly um, said early on, but I never finished my doctoral dissertation, so I never became a scholar. I became uh, somebody who goes out and interviews people and then blends all that with a little history, a little culture, a little literature into a big uh, Moulinex. And, and, uh, and I worked two, it out. I worked for eight years for, the, uh, for, for Time Magazine. And we always, the, our bosses always said, you have to think the reader is intelligent, but uninformed. You have to think the reader is intelligent, but not in the wrong. And what, is, what does that mean? I mean? It means that you shouldn't talk down to the reader, but then you shouldn't say the well-known designer, Eric A. But it comes like, who's going to know that? You know, you shouldn't condescend. Uh, you should um, uh, fill the reader in right away, but don't, but don't talk down to her. Well, but you know something, you, much of your nonfiction writing is like that. You, you, write like, you write like a scholar and a poet, but it's accessible to everybody. Well, thank you. And, and I think that was my training. I mean, I, right out of college, I was, a, a, you know, I worked as a trainee at, at a, a time. And they had various, you know, you didn't sign anything in those days, everything was, but, but we had too many chiefs and not enough Indians. So there were endless number of editors who could justify the existence that send the, the damn copy back to you sometime and uh, to rewrite. So anyway, you, uh, sometimes I could submit on the test time the one I'd done the first. <laughs> 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 Well, I know that because I worked for Newsweek, so I could work for the for the uh, the competition. It was the same sort of thing. Yeah. I, had, I once had an editor who wrote at the top of my copy, "You cannot write your way out of a paper bag." Ooh. 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 Not true. No. Well, you, you I got some, you got the you wrote right. your way out of many paper, paper bags. Yes. yes. <laughs> so okay, so but. So you decide what, um, well, you also made the, the choice with the flanar. I'm just interested in how it is that a work, uh, that, that, that a project like this takes shape. 
Well, it, it was the fun air was very scary because uh, um, Bloomsbury has decided to start a series of, about writers in the city, and uh, and I was the first one. So I said to the editor, "Should we have an index?" And she said, "I don't know." I, she said, "I said, should it have photographs? I don't know. Uh, should it be uh, a history? I don't know. I mean, she let me do whatever I wanted, which is terrifying, you know, because you want somebody to set limits. Yes. But anyway, I didn't. So how did you? How did you do that? I, mean, I, I just called my own friends, you know, and wrote about things I actually knew about." For those of you who don't know the, the Flaneur, it truly is the best book that's been written about the uh, about Paris in, a, in, in our generation and probably before that. And what's wonderful is that it's short yeah. because you can pick it up and it's a series of essays that are kind of loosely linked. You, know, you're, you're, you, you, you have Edmund White taking you by the hand through his Paris and you feel that you're 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 side by side with it, and that is what um, you know. A great writer does. Um, well, I think I mean that's also what you do here. How did you? I mean, you have history and geography and uh, literature and art and what did you sit down and write just a list of of what? Uh, well, I guess this is question would be both of you. I mean, someone some. Uh, uh, someone I, I can't remember said that um, uh, Walter Benjamin, I think I want to say that like you write the books that you'd like to read but they don't exist. I mean, did you did you say what would a did you say what would a book about Paris that I would want to read look like, or what would a book about the Seine I would want to read look like? I mean, I guess you'd have to. It's on, it's on the I haven't said that to myself, but it's not about the fun there, but my first novel, I got my first five novels rejected. So then you I did? I did. So you got I, your first five novels rejected? What well, did they I, say? But, well, they were gay, and so everybody said, uh, well, I myself am gay, but I was afraid if I spoke up for your book that people would think I was gay and be fired. <laughs> you know, because this was in the 50s and 60s. So anyway, uh, but then my- You showed that? Well, and then my uh, first novel, which you have to be have X-ray vision to decide it's gay. But uh, but anyway, I wrote a book. I said, what would I? Oh, I guess all my books are going to be rejected. But what would I like to read? And that that was my my key. And I think it's very hard for. Uh, I mean, writers keep trying to second guess the market, or. Or imagine what would be a bestseller. That's a very bad battle. I mean, I've known some writers who are bestsellers, and they are never condescending. They're writing at the peak of the top of their of their powers. They're not writing down. You know. Well, for your bestseller. Well, that was the Rudy Martyr book, but that that was an accidental bestseller because. Um, it, it, that, that's a book on the story of one street in Paris, and it's, it's why you can never, well, I don't know, maybe some people read a book and say it's going to be a bestseller, but I wrote the book, and I loved writing the book. It's a, it was a small book, a short book, about my love of the my neighborhood street, and it had just come out, and I was in the United States when the terrorist attack, attacks happened in November, of uh, 2015, and my last job at the New York Times happened to be European terrorism correspondent. So suddenly, I'm going on TV and radio as a, ter a terrorism expert. Nothing to do with the book, but they got to mention the book. And literally, I went on one NPR show, mm -hmm. uh, Fresh Air, and Terry Gross, who you know that I would like a candle to her. She cut it, and they cut it in such a way that she made me, made me sound brilliant, and the book shot to, for one week up to the bestseller list. So I wanted to say, Jamais, you never know. But um, it's, uh, it was an act of the power of all things. The power of the power of, 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 of kind of interesting thing about her is that, fresh air, so fresh is that she never wants to be face to face with the writer. Right. She wants to be in Philadelphia, you're in New York, or whatever. 
so that she can hear it the way the, the, the listener would. She never oh, wanted to be. Yes. Yeah. So, um, she got her start in, in radio in my hometown of Buffalo, New York. So she, under, she understands normal people. So, did you know her? No. Um, so, the, the Notre Dame fire occurred um, after. after the book so was in print. After the book was in print. After the, you know, there's bound galleys when you when you send the book out to reviewers and people who want to have them write nice things on the back of the book for you. The book was already in that form of bound galleys when uh, on April 15th of this year, Notre Dame went up in flames. I happened to be in New York and my husband called me and said, Elaine, I think I see a boat in the river, a fire boat. I think I think the Seine has something to do with Notre Dame. And what I what I you know, there are three things you can do. You can throw yourself out the window, you can um, hide under the, the bed covers for three months and pretend it didn't happen, or you can call your editor and say, I need to write an extra chapter. And what I discovered in my research was that the infrastructure on the Ile de la Cité was too weak to put out the fire. There wasn't enough volume of water and there wasn't enough water pressure. So the firefighters who were part of the French military, they're not part of the city of Paris, had to call a, a tank of a boat from the Marne River and send it through some of those loops that you saw early on to a lock which took forever for this boat to arrive in front of Notre Dame. They hooked up four hoses, and throughout the night, the boat pumped water from the Seine. And, and uh, as the, the, general got, the general, who was the commander of the firefighters, said to me, the water of the Seine saved Notre Dame. So was the schedule of publication um, Change? Did it change? No, because I wrote really fast. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. That's, 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 that's the, the, the good thing about being a journalist, again, you, you know, I tell young people who, who uh, yeah, I always have young interns or, in my life, and I say, you know, perfection in journalism doesn't exist. You know, accuracy and deadline, and that's it. I mean, does perfection exist elsewhere? Well, I think that I think if you're a real, true scholar, you you're looking for some kind of pure truth, and and maybe not perfection, but there's always another book to research. Isn't there a there saying perfection is the enemy of the good? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. So good, good enough is fine with me. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, maybe we should uh, turn it over to the audience. Who I'm sure about this. Where did you find out about uh, Ame Katz's Probably in one of the 500 or so books on Paris and France and the Seine that are clogging our, um, crowding our dining room, which is the place where I work. Yes. I mean, I did, my, my field of history was 18th century France, so Ame Katz was a little earlier, but if, I mean, you can find all these wonderful facts because the French love facts when they write histories. And did you find that most of those books have indexes with the said in the index? It, it, it depends on the book, it depends on the day. A lot of a lot of French books don't have indexes, which is infuriating. Yeah. There's a wonderful uh, two-volume work called the Plus Historique de Paris. Yes. I love that. And it, I don't know why somebody doesn't do it for New York, because it tells you who lived at every address in Paris, who famous. You know, this is where this man murdered his wife, and so on. And, uh, yeah, that's what we do now. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do it. Want to do it? Three of us can do it. Huh? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Um, and uh, the Um, a number of major cities are bisected by a river, but the two sides are not necessarily terribly different from each other, whereas in Paris, the left and right banks are famously different. Why do you think that is? 
Well, it's the it's the it's the different history. It's um, that the um, it, and I welcome your views as well from the two scholars to my to my left. You know, the the left bank uh, was the um, was sort of the intellectual university um, uh, scholarly part of the uh, of the river, and the and the right bank was the new money where the industrialists and uh, and bankers and insurance companies all came and, and spread north. Um, no, that sounds right. I mean, it's true that, like, uh, you know, French people will say, oh, she's very right back, meaning uh, she wears beautiful clothes, but she's a little stuffy, and, uh, and she's rich, probably. And, and left back is bohemian. Well, I mean, it's, you know, however, we stand, we have lots of rivers, but Central Park divides. Um, uh, I mean, the upper, upper East Side and Upper West Side, for instance, have kind of a similar. Um, I don't know. I grew up in New York, so I always I find that I um, always, without realizing, it took me many, many years to realize this, map New York geography onto anywhere I go. Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually work, and it's not a helpful thing, but I seem to have a, a hard time not doing that. I, something that I discovered recently is that Le Corbusier in 1925 um, uh, proposed to raise much of the right, uh, the, left, the right bank um, and put up, uh, put up 60 story cruciform towers um, and so basically to do a, a 20th century version of what Houseman did. But of course, in 1925, the elevator had been invented, which mercifully was not the case when Houseman was, uh, was, was raising central Paris. Um, and so you would have had uh, it, it just an unthinkably different, um, uh, I mean, as you said Houseman in the mid 19th century, when he, he, he destroyed the Paris that we don't know. Fact. We, we can't fully really imagine what, um, if you read um, novels that, uh, you read Balzac, for instance, who's often harking back to the beginning of the 19th century, um, he's talking about how different things were, you know, in, in, in 1810, but he's writing in 1837 or something, and uh, you realize, in fact, what he's talking about doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it already didn't exist anymore in 1835, but it certainly doesn't exist after Houseman. If Le Corbusier had been allowed to destroy much of the central right bank and put up 60 story cruciform towers, um, I think there would be fewer starry eyed tourists wandering around trying to, to, to try to put their walks on bridges. Well, what you evoke, you, you, you use the date 1837. 1837 is the date of. Uh, in which the building that we live in now was built mm -hmm. because um, my neighborhood was so trite and insignificant that Ausman just passed over it. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, we, you know, talking about uh, neighborhoods, and then uh, uh, tell, uh, tell our um, audience what you were saying about the, uh, what people say about uh, the Ile Saint Louis and its relationship to Paris. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, when I first moved there, uh, there were still a lot of old people who lived uh, in uh, Chambre de or something, and they, uh, you talk to them, and I mean, there's still a woman who ironed, uh, she put the, the irons on a revolving hot plate, and then she'd take each iron, which had no electricity at all, and, and I said, why do you do that, madame? And she said, because it's, it's a better. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but but a lot of a lot of people didn't, without electricity. right right, and a lot of people didn't have uh, burning water, and the, a lot of people uh, uh, went to the public baths on, even on the Yosemite, and and a lot of people say, "Oh, I'm I'm going to Paris today." Uh, you know, go from Yosemite across the bridge. And so wait, but this was when? This was when you were uh, there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 60s and then, uh, and then in the 80s. Well, okay. if, if, you, if you live in the Chambre de Mont, you have to go to the public bath. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, in Montmartre, even today, some people will say, I'm going to Paris. 
Yeah. Because Montmartre until 1860 was a was a village, and there still is a, an identity of Montmartre that that the people of Montmartre like to hold on to. And they got uh, windmills and gardens. Yes. Right. They've still got one. Yes. Oh, that's a question. If, if no one else has a question, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about art and the Seine. Um, what were some of the paintings you talked about? I nearly drowned in the art of the Seine. I'm not an art historian, and, and there are entire books written about Monet on the Seine, Turner on the Seine. Uh, the, the, the Seine uh, was the subject of art going back to. Um, well, in, certainly in, in uh, engravings to the Middle Ages, and then um, you know in the 17th, 18th centuries, if, if you've been to the uh, Carnival Museum, you'll see these extraordinary uh, paintings, which are kind of like documentaries of what Paris looked like because they they uh, captured Paris life on the Seine with the animals going into the river. They're, they're, they're extraordinarily they're like they're almost like photographs. And then people lived on the bridges. Yes. Uh, and they yes. had shops, and the, there were like four stories, five stories on each bridge. And all of this was captured in, in the art of the, of, the, of the period. So you can, you can see a documentary history of, of this sense through the art. And then, of course, we know the Impressionists who discovered light and, and the movement of the Seine. It was a sense very slow moving river. And, it's, and you know, Monet used to have his boat right on the Seine. He used to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Go out on his boat and sit on the river because he had to capture the light when the when the sun came up. I remember that there's a very interesting um, section in your book about the bodies of Paul Valley. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, the sin is not it's not just a happy river; it's a, it's a river of tragedy, and uh, uh, there is a, a a river police force uh, that we got from the Guardians of the Peace. Uh, they think they're like the French version of Miami Vice. Do any of you remember that TV TV series um, here? They all want to have jaguars and very alligators. Um, but one of their jobs is to prevent people from committing suicide, uh, which is um, which is more common than you would, you would think. And I think the worst sad story I know is that uh, in the early 60s, all of these Arab protesters who uh, were near um, the Louvre. Oh, protesting the war in Algeria. Algeria. And they yes. were all pushed into the river and killed. Yes, in, 19, in, in 1961. And there's no precise figure of how many were, were killed by police, pushed in by police. And there's a plaque to them now, but it has, just says, you know, doesn't say the, uh, the number. Which, which, which is probably in the hundreds. Of hundreds. Yes. Yes, sir. I was wondering what, what your impression is of the Italian flowers, the beans you put in on the microphone. I repeat the question what, what your impression is of the, the beach that's installed in some of these Italian flowers, whether you think it's destructive of the river or adds to the river? It depends on the day. Sometimes I like the fact that the current mayor of Paris and her predecessor it, it had transformed the lower banks of the Seine into kind of places of recreation. Uh, but but sometimes it kind of drives me crazy to uh, because the, the the banks have become kind of uh, you know there are all these boats where people stay up all night and, and party and. Uh, have sex. They have sex. Yeah, they have sex. They do. I don't know. Um, uh, and make a lot of noise and throw a lot of stuff into the into the into the river and uh, the, the 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 banks, the lower banks, so of the center. You can't yeah. the night, can you? I don't think so. No, oh, sure. You can. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, they, they go. Because I once saw maybe it was a runner. I once saw a sign. Closes. Well, some of it closes, but there's a lot of, I mean, some of the activities close, like yes. the circus and the, the tumbles and things like that. But but there is so much nightlife on the Seine that um, uh, it's changed the character of the lower banks of the Seine. And uh, 
Well, but I mean, part of some of it's nice. Like you saw, you can, you can take free uh, salsa dancing uh, classes on, on the set. Uh, you talking about? I didn't do salsa, but I did other kinds of dancing. Thank you very much. I think I'm a little too my hubby, you know, I won't reveal too much about my personal <laughs> life and, to, and to, <laughs> my dancing, my dancing life. You are a journalist. But yes, I dance. I did. You have to get involved in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. But they did. That one of the wasn't there. There was a runway that was on the lower bank. Um, yes. the traffic that is now close to traffic, which is a good thing. Well, it's a good thing if you're a jogger or a, or a runner, a jogger or a bicyclist or a walker of dogs. Also, tables down there. Tables down there. If you try to run a business up above where you're at least, you, you, there's so much more air pollution up, up above and, and traffic because people have not stopped driving their cars and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, try to try to uh, drive to a restaurant if uh, mm -hmm. if uh, it, it's it's quite quite uh, difficult. I don't I think it's great there's there's excellent there. public transportation. There's excellent yes right. there is and we sold our car thank you very much because the mayor banned cars before uh, 1997 from driving during the week so we don't have a car so we take public transportation yes. Which now is the vacuum brief source there's a bunch of booths, absolutely, and, and more use of the river than before. There's a property supermarket chain, for example, moves its goods along the river now instead of, uh, in addition to by truck, because it's uh, it's greener to, to do that, yes. Other questions, comments? Well, I'd like to ask both of you what, what your... When you think about the identity of the Sen, what, what, what does it say to you, either in terms of your own experience or in terms of uh, literature? Well, well, as a gay man, I, I like it because it was a good place to cruise. I mean, now with all, the, uh, all that activity, it's all ruined. But, uh, but it used to be that you could uh, go down there and pick somebody up, you know. And uh, I, uh, I lived on the Yale San Luis for eight years. And at the end of the island, um, the, 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 there was a park, and then steps that led you down to the water level. And there was tons of activity going on in that park. And it's a bad guy on? No, one on the other end. Uh, but, and so anyway, the, uh, there was a, and also under, under, uh, under the uh, guard of Austerlitz, there was a lot of activity, but all that's gone now because uh, too many lights and too much, uh, too many tourists and so on. But anyway, it was exciting. Yeah, I mean, the, under the bridges is not the, the necessarily the, 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 the most desirable place to, to have sex because it's dark and damp and dangerous. And, and, right? da and da well, it's dangerous less from humans than. Um, there's a study that came out that says there's two million human inhabitants of Paris, and um, and four million furry little creatures um, that uh, that are called you know, the same the same thing as ratatouille. You know, so that you don't necessarily want to consort with them on the banks of the Seine. <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, that's the last time I have sex under a bridge. <laughs> 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 to, to me, the most haunting memory of the Seine is somebody playing the saxophone under a bridge. Yes. Uh, you know, it seems like, I don't know, they still do that. They still do, yes. Yes. Um, when I was writing a chapter on cinema, I walked with the, the cinematographer, uh, Darius Ponchi, who was an Iranian-born uh, cinematographer who did the cinematography for uh, Midnight in Paris, you know, that, that wonderful opening five minutes where at the end of it you just say, I want to get out the next plane in Paris. So I asked him if he would take me along the set and show me what he sees as, as someone who looks at, at the river through uh, the prism of a of a camera, and and there was a musician under one of the bridges, and it just is one of those magic moments where you just say, "Gosh, you feel like it's a moment of discovery." Yeah. 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 Yes. I feel like it's going to seem like really me for so long, but there's a lot of similarities between New York and Paris. It's not 
New York, we don't pull out the water. The state that supplies the city. But I was struck by you saying people go into the city and they never lived in the narrow borough. I've <laughs> always lived in the city. <laughs> Everybody in the other borough says, says we're going, going to, to the city. Going to the city. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right, Pat. Yeah. And I, I've known people uh, who lived in New Jersey who never visited New York. That's true. No, but you know that there are people who live in the in the in the in the banlieue, in the suburbs of Paris. Never come to to enjoy the scent. You know, they never come to the Luxembourg Gardens. And I don't know if those of you have seen that uh, iconic uh, French film that was made in the 1990s, La Anna. Yeah. This there's a, there's a one glimpse of the Eiffel Tower as if it is so far away, and the scent is not in that in that film. Yeah, I, I I've been mean, I can't help thinking of my I taught a course in, um, in Paris a couple of uh, years ago, and the students, um, it was a Yale course, it was not a Columbia course, and the students were um, uh, learning about the Belle Epoque for, uh, for five weeks, and they were housed in the 7th arrondissement, and they were, um, uh, and, and the classes were in the 7th arrondissement right near Sèvres um, Babylon, and those students, I would say, like, where have you gone? What have you seen um, when you're not in uh, in class? And they only saw the sand. I mean, they never saw they never saw the bon I find I dragged them out to um, to uh, Le Pré Saint Gervais to have couscous because I was afraid that they were never going to see anything other than areas where there are right around the yes. sand where there are only tourists and rich people. Um, and I actually pointed this out to them, and they were like, "Oh yeah, I thought maybe." That was the case when I saw that there were all these. Um, they they noticed that they, they concluded that um, there were a lot of rich people there when they saw that there were a lot of luxury brand stores. That was how they arrived at this conclusion. So I mean, it also goes the other way. Um, no, but that's absolutely true. If you if you come to Paris as a tourist, you can you can see only a certain part of Paris. You know, if you stay in a Lovely hotel. You see the sand. You go to the museums, and and uh, yes, and you and, only you only stick around yes. the sand. Well, in fact, uh, it's interesting you say that about those students. When I I was teaching a course at Princeton a few years ago, uh, in their journalism program, and it was local reporting using Paris as a case study, and we brought the students to Paris for their spring break, and I told them they could not go on a bateau rouge, they could not go to the Louvre, and I took them to. San San Denis, one of the, the suburbs, um, the troubled suburbs. I took them to the Ranchis Wholesale Food Market at five o'clock in the morning. I took them to Pantin, another another uh, suburb in the in the north the east part of, of Paris, because I wanted them to see another Paris. And one kid ran off to the Louvre on his free time, and two women went dancing on a bateau mouche, one of the tourist boats, and uh, they didn't get an A on those assignments. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to get people away from the side I am And yes, sir. Yeah, on that score, let's say the less desirable places in Paris, I thought it would have been important. This movie, which was just shown at the French Institute uh, the other night, Les Miserables, which, oh, which I've heard that's really good. It, it, it's fantastic and it's going to open up it, very, very shortly. It's uh, Victor Hugo's. It takes place in the same town where Hugo wrote Baby Zimba. And it's about uh, basically uh, African and Arab uh, inhabitants, wild and teenagers, and they're interplayed with the police. And it's a brilliant movie. Uh, so it's thank, you. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I've also heard that. It's a great We always think of it like the Ile de la Cité being the most expensive and glamorous. Uh, plays in, in Paris, but that's where uh, Les Mystères de Paris, where all the poor people live. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, also, I mean, same thing in New York, the um, neighborhoods that, uh, that were uh, extremely different in, in even uh, just a few decades ago are now. Harlem. Uh, Harlem, and also, like, the, what, um, 
uh, the Lower East Side. Um, well, where I live, Chelsea. Well, I mean, when I first came to New York in 1962, uh, uh, I go to Chelsea, and uh, people were sitting on their stoops throwing beer bottles into the street. There were no trees. You know, it's all completely changed. But you still throw beer bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that, Gabrielle has a question. I just was wondering if you could talk more about the cleanup effort to make it sense when we walked. Oh, uh, this is my daughter, Gabrielle, asking about the cleanup effort to make the sand uh, swimmable. Uh, Jacques Chirac, when he was running uh, uh, for re election as mayor, promised that the sand would be swimmable within a few years. And then in, by 1995, he had to admit that uh, that he had uh, he was a little too ambitious in, uh, in, in his prediction. Uh, the current mayor, Annie Dalvo, is determined to make the Sen swimmable by 2024 when Paris hosts the Summer Olympics. If the Sen is much cleaner than it was in 1990. Jacques Chirac skinny the thing of the Sen. There were some great Canara Chine uh, 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 illustrations and cartoons. But uh, it's, it's a lot cleaner. And uh, I mean, the river police have to swim every single day in the Sen. And uh, they live. Uh, and, um, in 1990, for example, there were only four species of fish in the Seine, and now there are almost three dozen. Yeah. You can't eat them, but you can catch them. It's totally doable. They've done it in New York City. New York City used to be the river husband river tomorrow. Yes. I had a story that a lot of my friends would have entered those swims swimming around the whole island, and they would touch all kinds of things dead, you know, animal, big Oh, just, yeah, just all kinds of we need you in Paris. Bring your uh, and river not, team. I'm not saying that I didn't touch one. For two and a half hours, I didn't touch one object a couple years ago. It's very clean now. No floating dead things. That's no floating dead things. So I'm not anything. I can touch a cigarette, but you know, with my hand, you're going like this for two and a half hours. Was it Pete Seeker? Bring them all to Paris. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. I would like to um, point out that the Seine, the river that made Paris, is on sale, and that you should really, I, again, I know that you were furtively ordering it from Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Please buy copies out of here, support your um, local independent bookstore. Um, and I would like so right out there um, in front of the door there in the lobby of uh, Viola Hall, I would like to uh, to thank very warmly Elaine Shalina and Edmund White for graciously agreeing to come and talk about it.